Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 11, beginning in verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness, you fools. Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. One of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. And he said, Woe to you lawyers also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. So you are witnesses, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the king key of knowledge, you did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. As he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. This is God's word for us today. All right, I'm so thankful Pastor John gave me such an upbeat scripture to uh, work with this morning, you know. Uh, but seriously, we're going to continue. If, you, if you're from Wingfoot, uh, we're just going to continue in a sermon series called Dinner with Jesus. And when Pastor John called and asked me if I wanted to talk about these uh, table encounters, of course I had to accept as a, a pastor that's trying to plan a church in Canton called the table, I think these stories are significant. And I think they're significant because Jesus came with a message about the kingdom. You know, we just sang about that, Solomon and Eve just, just led, it, uh, uh, led us in song talking about his kingdom. And he talked about it all the time. And everywhere he went, he said the kingdom was brought into the presence of people. And the primary way that he showed us what the kingdom looked like was the table. So you could say, very simply, that discipleship looks more like a dinner party. Outreach more lo looks more like past the taters, you know? Breaking down barriers looks more like a barbecue. And if you've been here uh, through this sermon series, you know that Jesus sat at a variety of different tables with a variety of uh, uh, different people. And it was his favorite spot to uh, teach and to establish change which often made things interesting because when you try to establish change, you invite conflict, which kind of tees up our story today. But before we get into that story, I want to share with you a story of my own. And recently, me and my wife uh, sent our youngest off to preschool. And uh, we were feeling kind of sentimental about that. You know, it's our last one going through and kind of the end of an era for us and you know, there's that first time you send the kid off to school, it's just really hard, right? Do I have any parents in here? None? Okay, I got one, two. All right. Are you guys awake this morning? I mean, I just, yeah. 
So uh, that first time it's hard, you know. They've been with you every waking second of the day, and all of a sudden you're sending them off to strangers. So uh, that day can be filled with a lot of anxiety and a lot of crying, and uh, even the kids can do some of that too, you know. <laughs> uh, really, they do, they do better than we did, but... Uh, you know, I started reflecting about, so we got three kids, and I started reflecting about the other two, and I thought to myself, I said, you know, Josh, Michelle ought to have, a, have an opportunity uh, at this milestone as I had been the one to take the other two, right? So I went and told her my plan, and y'all, you couldn't believe it, but she actually told me that she was the one who took Aubrey to school, and I couldn't believe that she would just lie to me like that, right to my face, the man of God, you know, she's a pastor's wife, and she's making stuff up like that, and I said, I told her she was wrong, uh, told her she was wrong because I remember those days very clearly in my mind, to which she told me a story about when she took Aubrey in, and she had a story that, because I'm happily married, and I want to stay that way, I won't tell you, but uh, to, to back her up. And so I started getting irritated uh, with Michelle, that she would just make me think I'm crazy like that. And I, it dawned on me that we have these smartphones now, and I have evidence to prove just how wrong she was. So I think I got a picture of that. So I, I was looking through my phone, and I was so excited I found these pictures, right? Until I looked a little closer, that, that picture on the right there where there's a mirror, that half woman in the picture is my wife. I was speechless. I was sure I was right. I felt right. You know, and I reacted to, I reacted to Michelle out of my superior knowledge and insight because I felt fully confident. But what I found out, I was just full of it. And that's what I want to talk with you today. That's the name of my sermon. Uh, you're full of it. Yeah. So I guess that kind of seems like a bold and possibly rude thing for me to say to you today, especially because I'm a guest in this place. And this might be the last time I'm ever invited back. But uh, how dare I say you're full of it? Well, let me say two things. One, I'm not claiming to be any better than you on this Matter of fact, what you are about to hear is probably a sermon that I preached to myself, and you're just going to be witnesses of that. The second thing is, I'm not telling you that you're full of it. Jesus is. So, the, the thing about being full of it, it's easy for us to see this in other people, right? But so difficult to see it in ourselves. And I think that happens because it's it happens slowly, right? Like, we don't get there overnight. It, it happens because we have to believe a lie long enough that we don't actually see the lie anymore. You know, no one with an addiction will tell you what they are doing at first was a good thing. They've just done it so many times that they become numb to the warnings. So it, it wasn't our intention to be full of it. It just kind of happens. So how does it happen? That's what I want to talk about. So I think it happens, first of all, because of what we focus on. The text says that they were surprised when they noticed Jesus didn't wash his hands before the meal. So in Christian circles, the Pharisees are known as the bad guys, right? They're the whipping boys of the New Testament and examples of what we're not supposed to. Uh, to be like. Now, as long as I've been in ministry and doing this thing, everyone's got a favorite character in the Bible, right? I bet yours is Solomon. Uh, and it's someone they can relate to and identify with. But no one, as long as I've been doing this, ever says, yep, I'm the Pharisee. And that's strange because the Pharisees were actually the good guys. Uh, they were honored and respected because they lived and breathed the law. What the two-thirds of your Bible, what we call the Old Testament, that, that was all they did. So when the law was copied, when the law was spoken, when the law was explained, it, it came from a Pharisee. So in a very real sense, if those people were trying to imagine what God was like, 
a picture of a Pharisee is what came to mind. Um, there's so much I could tell you about Pharisee, but I, John says I don't have that much time. So, but, but I think what's just real critical, real simply, it, just to understand what it means. So Pharisee means separate or to, to separate. And uh, that's exactly what they did. They separated themselves from others because not only did they think they knew better, they actually thought they were better. Uh, and they were happy to let everyone know that because, to be honest with you, they enjoyed that spotlight. Now, I know that's hard for us to relate to because the Bible is a very old document and uh, people don't behave like that anymore. You know, that was a primitive time back then and, and so you're just going to have to use your imagination, which I'm being sarcastic right now. <laughs> Are you guys awake? Am I doing all right, babe? Okay. Okay, the jokes don't get any better than this, so you're just gonna have to, just gonna have to go like that. Um, but these uh, these Pharisees became like this morality police, right? Because uh, they 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 made these updates to the laws, and really they had to because the whole Old Testament was written under a time when these people were ruled under God and by people from their nation. Now they are being ruled by the Romans, and the Romans don't care about the law, right? They just want their taxes. So they help people out by trying to make this law clearer in their new context. And instead, they did that by making these extra rules. Rules that focused on outward displays of this righteousness. And they were very critical of those who didn't comply with, with them, just like we find in our text. So it says, when they noticed Jesus didn't wash his hands before the meal, they were surprised. So this... This isn't a surprise like a high school girl, like, oh, this is so neat. But this is like, how dare you? Now, you've got to know that nowhere in the Old Testament is this hand washing commanded, right? It's just one of their extra rules. And not only, I mean, if I had more time, they would do these ornate processes just for washing their hands. You thought COVID was something like, they had special water and special techniques for doing this. And, and it wasn't just their hands. They, they had all kinds of ceremony washings like Jesus talks about later with the dish. The point is, they focused on the outside things. And I'm sure all of this kind of seems kind of petty to us, Right? Except uh, we're not all that much different. You see, we're intoxicated with outside things. You know, we are addicted to what everyone is saying or doing. I bet most of you got up and flicked through some kind of media, right? We got to know what Trump said. We got to know what Biden said. We got to know what Biden said about what Trump said. We got to know what... Hollywood thinks about coronavirus. We got to know what LeBron James thinks about what Kyrie thinks about. I mean, we're just, we can't stop. And so we've created a billion dollar industry that beeps and buzzes and bings with up to date information about what everyone's saying or doing, right? You've all been there. Like, there's some people that live so much on the outside that they're just oblivious to what's going on on the inside, right? You ever been in the store? and you're trying to walk, and someone's just glued to that thing about to take you out, right? Right? Is it just me? Is it just me? Okay, it's just me. I'm going to preach to people nodding their head. Okay. So uh, how about this? This is just, this is, I just thought about this. So you answer the question, how are you doing, by saying what you are doing, right? You ever think about that? And really, people don't want you to tell them, how you are doing, right? And if you do, they'll probably never ask you that question again because we're consumed by the outside things. How about uh, we try to impress people by externals, right? We try to impress people by the outside things. I mean, if I'm being really vulnerable right now, like, I want you to think I'm good. I want you to think uh, I'm able to handle the Word of God properly. I want you to think I look good. My wife dressed me today. Don't I look sharp, you know? <laughs> Uh, right? Because I'm worried about what you think of me, right? If I'm being honest, what a, you know, I don't know who to give credit to, but someone said something like this. We spend money we haven't earned to buy things we don't want to impress people we don't really care about, right? Um, 
Ladies, I, ladies, I hate to pick on you, right? But it just, I got to talk about high heels, right? There's not a woman in here that loves wearing high heels. I mean, I, I doubt anyone's wearing them today because it's kind of cold. But like, the first thing a lady will do when she's wearing high heels is kick those bad boys off, right? Now, why on earth would you wear something that you hate so much? Well, because... The outside tells you that's, that's what pretty is, right? How about uh, coloring our hair? And you say, that's easy. You don't have any hair, sir. And I was like, well, touche. But it, it's starting to show up in my beard. The grays, right? They're starting to show up in my beard, so I'll cut them, right? Because I want you to see my oldness. Now, now, think about this. We color and cut our hair. Not because we don't know how old we are after we do that, right? So why do we do it? Well, because the outside tells us that old is bad. We're trying to impress people with the outside. Uh, we think all our solutions to our problems come from the outside. I'm really beating this over, but this is the important point of the sermon, right? We think all the solutions to our problems come from the outside. And that's true. Sometimes they do, right? Why are you always late, Solomon? Because you need to set an alarm, right? That'll fix it every time. Why don't you get your work done? Because you need to spend time doing your work. Probably getting off Amazon. That, that wasn't as subtle as I was hoping. Um, but, but uh, you know, like, many people deal with depression and anxiety. It's a real thing. Many people, many people deal with depression and anxiety. It's... It's something that we do. And most of the time, we try to deal with that with uh, drugs or alcohol, prescription drugs, right? Uh, but, but that just kind of masks it. You know, it'll temporarily make you feel better. Let me nuance that. Because I know, like, there are some chemical things in your brain. Like, I don't, I don't want you to hear me say this pastor just said, uh, you can't take drugs. for like there, There's some chemical imbalance in your head, and people, people need that. But if they only get that, it's not going to fix them. You know, if you're, if you're uncontent because you're single, you will never be happy with someone else. She'll just make both of you miserable. Right? We've, we are tired of evil in the world, so every election cycle we think a new president and more laws are going to fix everything. Right? And just on and on we keep going. The point is we do all this stuff because we assign value and worth based on the outside stuff. And so when we only focus on the outside stuff, the outside stuff becomes a measuring stick for ourselves and for other people. And to complicate this matter even more, everyone else seems to have a different measuring stick. So what do we do? We're just like the Pharisees. We separate ourselves from other, and I'll find this group who thinks like me and reinforces me in my echo chamber of our superior knowledge, and we'll just sit around and think about how stupid everyone else is, right? Does this sound like anything familiar to you? 2,000 years ago, this guy had it figured out. So, why is that a problem? We're on to point number two. Look at us go. We're cooking now. Why is that a problem? Well, the text says uh, that Jesus kind of responds to them. That uh, you're clean on the outside. You, you clean the outside the, of the cup or dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. So Jesus uses their, this familiar practice of washing to uh, point out the problem. And his concern here is not with dirty dishes. You can't go home today and say, I am done washing dishes, because Jesus just isn't into that. Uh, and you can't do that because Jesus here is not concerned uh, with dishes because dishes don't hold greed and wickedness. Hearts do. Jesus... Uh, Jesus says our, our dirty hearts make us full of it, full of ourselves. Now you're seeing where I'm getting my sermon taught, right from Scripture, right there, right? We're full of it. And, uh, you know, Pharisees, and don't think religious guys when I say Pharisees. Use the definition that we just, uh, we just went through. So Pharisees want to look good and impressive on the outside, but inside we're rotten. Can I say this how I want to say it? 
Can I, can I go hillbilly on you for a minute? Is that okay? Okay. You can polish a turd, but at the end of the day, it is still a turd. All right, I won't do that anymore. But that, that's, what he, that's, what, that's what he's saying. Like, uh, you know, we try to polish and pizzazz and pump up these outsides uh, to try to fool people, but they're really just containers that, that hold what's on the inside, right? That's what a container does, right? It holds stuff. So what we are on the outside is a reflection of the inside. Jesus would say it like this, that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, that a good tree is going to bear good fruit. Yeah, I got one. And a bad tree is going to bear, oh man, you guys are sharp, sharp. So that's why the Bible constantly wards us to guard our hearts, because what? Everything you do flows from the heart, all right? So I, I normally don't do this, but it, so in a context, right before this dinner party, these Pharisees, right before, before Jesus got invited, he made the same point. If you go back later and look at it, he, he talks about how the eye is the lamp of the body. And what, he, what he's saying there is that our eyes help us see and distinguish between light and darkness, right? But if your eye is dirty or distorted, you can't see properly. See, I have this... Uh, I guess they call it astigmatism. Is there any eye doctors in here? Good, so I can just make it up like I want to. So I have this astigmatism, I think, right? And it, it, I can't see clearly or right in the dark. It, 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 it's not that when I look and can't see something that it's not there, I just can't see it. So I need a corrective lens to be able to see properly. And see, that's the problem. If we only measure and judge things by externals that are distorted by the lens of our heart, then to be honest, our rightness because, becomes the cause of our blindness. And ooh, I know that's a hard pill for us to swallow, right? Because our whole sense of value and worth and identity are tied to these measuring sticks that we use for people. And so what, what do you do when, when you're feeling attacked? You will deny, you will demean, you will slander anyone or anything that tries to tell you differently. Scripture is consistent in warning us about our hearts, that they are deceitful above all things. And what? Beyond Cure. Who can understand it? And, you know, I started thinking about that. That should caution us from believing anything we tell ourselves. Because if we are, uh, if we're being honest about our voices, our voices aren't really all that honest. We will make promises to ourselves that we don't keep. You know, New Year's is coming up around the corner, right? We're going to make those resolutions, right? All these things you're going to do. And we don't even hardly get a week into it. It's all down the drain. It doesn't have to be New Year's, right? I mean, I'm going to start this thing tomorrow. I'm going to start my diet tomorrow. I'm going to start being on time tomorrow. You know, whatever it is, fill in the blank for you. Now think about this. What would you do with a person in your life that constantly made promises to you but never kept them? Yeah. But for some reason, you just give yourself the pass, right? You give yourself the pass. Another thing we do, we talk ourselves into things that we know are bad. Just ask anybody that's ever been to a bachelorette or a bachelor party, right? Okay, just me. I'm the only crazy one here. I'm the only one that, yeah. And it doesn't even have to be with a group of people. I mean, you can do it all by yourself, you know? I can have, just, just... I normally wouldn't do this, but I can do it this time. Just one more. I can handle one more. This, 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 ex, this, this thing, I can handle this, you know? And probably for me, the one that hits me the hardest is that my voice is just ruthless to me. I mean, I'm standing, I mean, your voice probably says, uh, you're not 
young enough, pretty enough, attractive enough, smart enough. You don't belong here. You always mess up. I don't even know why you're trying. You, everything you do just falls apart. You know, if someone spoke to my wife like that, I know I'm a pastor, right? If someone spoke to my wife like that, they would meet unpastor Josh very, very quickly. But for some reason, I let, allow that same message, unlimited access, just to roll around in my head. If we are being honest, if we're being real, if we're putting stuff on the table, our voices should be the last voice we look to for advice about what's good or bad. So what are we to do? My last point. What's the solution? Well, Jesus says, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. So Jesus says, if we want to be clean, that we need to be generous to the poor. Which I find that interesting, because it kind of sounds like Jesus just said we should do something on the outside to fix our inside, which would totally mess up my sermon right now, because Jesus would be disagreeing with me, right? You know. So is Jesus no better than the Pharisee here? I don't know if I'm good, but this man's laughing at me, so I'm going to keep going, right? That's good. So here, here's what you need to notice. Jesus didn't say give to the poor. He said be generous. So yes, uh, this would be a re- total re- reorientation of the heart. Yeah, uh, being generous would probably lead you to giving. But wanting to give would, come, would have to come from a heart that was generous in the first place. So the, the question, I guess, at least in my mind, the way I kind of looked at it was, you know, how do we change our hearts? How do, how do, we, how do we become generous? Well, God talked about this long ago, and uh, you could pick any passage you want. I like Ezekiel, uh, an old prophet, and he said, I'll give you a new heart. We sang about this. I'm going to give you a new heart and put in you a new spirit. I'm going to remove that heart of and give you a heart of flesh. So I got a theology degree, but you don't need one to understand that. It's God that changes your heart. Which leads us to another question. Why hasn't God changed my heart? Well, Jesus comes claiming to be an answer to that. He's going to deliver on that promise, and he wants to give us life. But not just any life, an abundant life with an overflowing heart that gives because it's been given. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Amen, brother. And he says the way we get to that is by being born Again, so I know you all had the birds and bees talk, and you typically don't talk about that in church, but since I'm just that guy, I'm going to dip my toe in there, and uh, I'll be careful, Uh, but we can just do this simply. Life is a product of intimacy. Maybe, Maybe I can say it like, it takes two To tango, right? It takes two to make the tango fry. No? Okay. But it takes two, right? It takes two. And so it takes two parties coming together in enough time and through their intimacy to create something that wasn't there before, right? Um, There's no other way around it, right? You can't get life without intimacy. And the reason is why some of you Uh, don't have the life that you want and don't have the hearts that you want is because you're spending all your time with the wrong things, with the outside things, and with the surface things. And that will produce in you something, but it's probably something you don't want to have. And God is willing to move in your life. He wants to move in your life, but He's not going to force Himself on you. He's not that kind of lover, right? Right? 
And here's the other thing. God can't fill what you don't empty. Right? We've been talking about being full of it this whole time in a negative sense. But I'm here to tell you, God wants you full of it. He wants you full of his Holy Spirit. He wants you, when you're walking around, to be a temple, which means you've got the presence of God everywhere you go. Everywhere you step, just like Jesus, you are bringing the kingdom. And why? Because that spirit in you, he wants to produce in you the fruit of the spirit, of love, of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I maybe messed up the order, but I got them right, buddy. I got them right. That's all that counts, right? Don't judge me on the externals. I'm going here. You know, he wants you full to the measure of all the fullness of God, right? Uh, so uh, you can know how, uh, how wide and how long and how high and deep is the love of Christ, right? Not a love based on the outside stuff, but a love based on you being full of Jesus' righteousness, of being full of the same resurrection power that lifted Jesus up from the grave, right? So now you can go to God with confidence. He wants you fully confident. Confident not only that God cares for you, but he's working in you, even though it doesn't look good right now. And you can take this to the bank that he that began a good work in you is going to finish it, right? He wants to give you a... a he wants to give you faith that makes your fears frightened, right? He wants you full of that. He wants to give you a joy, an indescribable joy that even when it looks like bad or, honey, I'm nervous about this, that it doesn't matter about that. He wants to give you hope, not just regular hope, but a living hope, Solomon. I know this church planning looks hard, but guess what? We've got this strong anchor for our soul that's firm and secure. God wants you to be full of it, church. I'm, I'm wrapping up. I'm passionate because I struggle with this all the time. Outside stuff. God's got some work to do on the inside. And He can do it to you, to you. You gotta spend some time with Him. I gotta say this, but don't get fooled like the Pharisees. The Pharisees, you see, they. They had most of the Old Testament memorized. They went to Sabbath all the time, never missed. Don't think of the things you do as us Christians do, you know. I go to church. Pharisees tithe too. So what? Guess what Jesus said? You're missing the mark, boys. The other part is if you're not a believer in here today, you may be think I was harsh on you, but I'm not harsh on you. If you're honest, if, if you took what we just said honestly, you know you're missing something. You know your views. Can I say it how I want? It's jacked up. We're jacked up. Everybody in here is jacked up. If you're, if you're a visitor here today, you're like, these are a bunch of righteous people. I'm telling you, they're jacked up. Everybody's full of something. Give me that next slide. Maybe. Everybody's full of something. Jesus will pour the pure gospel message and transformation in any container. Broken containers, flashy containers, shot glasses. I know that makes you, it does, don't it? Yeah, he will, he don't care. Because the outside is not what's important. So here I go. Everyone's full of something. The question is, what are you full of? Pray with me. Father God, I thank you so much for loving us enough to send your son to die on a cross, a place that was meant for me, 
but he stood in my place. Father God, I need, we need more of you. We were made for intimacy with you. And I'm asking you to fill us with your life and with your love so that everything I do will be a reflection of that goodness you've put deep inside my heart. And I don't know everyone's story in here today, God, but you do. And I know you want to work in them. And I'm asking you to do that now. Father God, we love you. We give all the glory and honor and praise to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.